Hello and welcome to Global Sanctuary for Elephants' brand new podcast, Global Rumblings. Global Sanctuary for Elephants, or GSC for short, is a non-profit organization with a mission to create vast safe spaces for captive elephants where they are able to heal physically and emotionally, often from very traumatic pasts. I'm your host, Nadia Mari, and I'll be taking you to the lush jungle of the Mato Grosso region in central Brazil, home of GSE's initial project, Elephant Sanctuary Brazil. Currently home to six female Asian elephants, lovingly referred to as the girls. Hello and welcome to episode six of the Global Rumblings podcast. I am again joined by Kat and Scott Blaze from Brazil at the Elephant Sanctuary Brazil. Hello, you two. How are you? Hey, Nadja. <laughs> How are you? We're pretty good, I think. <laughs> doing well. How, how are things there? Yeah, well, it's cold in Europe, isn't it? I mean, it's winter time. Is it winter time with you guys as well? Or is it a warm winter? Why don't you know the word winter anymore? Winter? Cold? <laughs> it does get cold sometimes, but not your kind of cold. It's the rain season. That's so, how we know things now. Yeah. Dry season and rain season. And right now, everything is beautiful and green because it is the rainy season. It's, happy elephants, happy grass, oh, happy well, birds, bugs. Everybody's happy. Today is, we've seen, they've all been grazing uh, quite a bit uh, with the grass coming, uh, starting to be very, very lush. But it was really cool to see Gijamina today. Uh, she was just, you know, ripping oh. up all kinds of grass and, you know, shoving in her mouth. Just, uh, you know, again, it's it's what makes this all so incredible and amazing um, to these elephants that have 23 years of never even knowing what grass was. And now she's able to do the thing that is the most natural and, and simple for them is just walking and grazing. It's what they do for so many hours out of the day in the wild. And it's just, uh, it's just a beautiful sight. It's sanctuary. Oh, lovely. Oh, sanctuary of heaven, elephant paradise. But before this paradise was actually, well, came to came to exist, we left the last episode with the piece of land that you looked at falling through, the money that was promised, I would say, or at least, you know, you thought you were going to get the $100,000, I think, which, as you said, was a great start for a, a young nonprofit wasn't there. You had to swerve off the road to miss a near head-on collision, but luckily you weren't injured. You, you've got somewhere to live, although you do share it with a lot of mice who aren't very hygienic. <laughs> you haven't got the car, the money's gone and the property is gone, but you're not giving up because you know that, you know, you came over for Ramba, who is better now. Her health is better. You know, she's being uh, cared for, but she's still in Chile. You're in Brazil and you haven't got any land. So what happened then? You make it sound so lovely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, let me say before we carry on is a huge part of this and a huge part of why we're able to push through all that came up and there's still a lot more to come before we even got to the, found the land. Uh, but one of the only reasons why this has been able to be as successful as it has is because of the partnership that Kat and I share. Um, you can't do this alone. You know, there's no yeah. way that either of us would have survived alone out here <laughs> or with I anybody so. else <laughs> or with anybody oh. else that I have met in my life. You know, there's no way. It's just that there's so much that you endure. And to be able to share it with somebody that is equally passionate and equally committed um, and fully invested to giving elephants a better life uh, because none of these projects are easy. You know, a lot of times people learn about, have learned about our project or whether it be any of the sanctuaries around the world, you know, whether it be, you know, those in Asia with, you know, Boone Lots, Elephant Nature Park, you know, Elephant Haven, France, you know, PAWS, TESS in, in the U.S. All of those were exhaustive ex exhausting processes to get to the point where people actually started to know what they were all about so you know none of these projects are easy um this was it's not a nine to five it's not only not a nine to five it's so much <laughs> even if it, it's not even 24 7 i mean the emotional investment is i mean it's it's 28 7 mm. if that's possible uh it, it's just so much to be able to share this with somebody and that's when we start telling these stories about what 
carried forward. I mean, why we were laughing instead of crying <laughs> some of the times it was yeah. because <laughs> we had each other to kind of just is, Aww. you know, we do like everybody, we all have our moments. And I think the benefit of having two, one of the many benefits of having two people is that generally when you may be at a low point, the person that you're with isn't. So you're able to yeah. some sort of middle ground and carry on. We got this. Yeah. Both being at a low point isn't good. huh? No, there was a couple of times that we looked at each other with doubt in our eyes. What are we doing or what are we going to do? But we weren't there yet. You're right. You're right. We had no money. Yeah. Uh, promise of money. We had donated land. Both of those fell through uh, the car. And right around this time is when they told us, you know, you, we can't even think about giving you a car until the financial, I mean, until the formation of the association in Brazil is finalized and you have, I think it was two years of, of, of history of the organization before the city could donate the car the way they wanted to be able to donate it. So around this time also, no money, no, oh. no car. So now we're in Guadalajara de Norte, which is middle of nowhere, Brazil, um, a, a city that was, again, Wild West just a few years before, um, speaking very little Portuguese, uh, we did have a roof over our head. We had a, a house and uh, that was quite nice. Um, we had good friends from the English school as Kat introduced before. And they were really, uh, they provided a lot of sanity for us. You know, they really helped us. There are reasons that we ended up staying there and kept pushing forward because I mean, at that point, as Scott is gently saying, we were kind of on our own for mm. the most part. And you know, it is, as you mentioned, it's a different, well, it's a different continent. It's a different culture. It's a different language. And we didn't really know much about any of it because we were going to be surrounded by an organization and trying to push forward as quickly as possible. You know, so we didn't study Portuguese at home for months or years. We didn't before. have it. We had time to do it anywhere. We were building a new nonprofit in the United States and selling our stuff. There was no time to study. So we were in yeah. a relatively awkward situation, but again, just figuring out ways to move forward. And not to add more darkness to the scenario. Uh, knows there's light at the end. So there is okay. a lot of light at the end. It's beautiful at the end. So wh where we were living, again, is this a house that was loaned to us by the city. Um, it was next to an elementary school. And it was actually next to the gymnasium of the elementary school. And you have to realize <laughs> that construction in this part of Brazil doesn't contain solid walls, even in the most of the houses. If things are open. There's no seals underneath the okay. doors. Most windows don't have glass. It's just a shutter type system that closes. Sometimes they close, sometimes they don't. No screens uh, either. No screens. You know, bugs are everywhere just because it's just, I mean, you just, you're living basically in nature. And, and, and uh, even in the city, you're still surrounded by, you know, just living within the elements. Uh, no air conditioning, no heating. Not so it's really required. Nope. Um, it does get hot. Uh, but Guadalajara, Guadalajara. It got really, it was really hot in Guadalajara. It was much hotter than it is here. Um, so next to this gymnasium, at this gymnasium, the kids would arrive at six o'clock in the morning. And it seemed like Ooh. it was always time for physical education class. Um, <laughs> and they're always in the gymnasium <laughs> and screaming and balls bouncing. And it's just from that. And the school day is actually short for these kids. The school day is until about 1230, I think. But after the school day, they're allowed to play in the gymnasium still. And it's loud. I mean, it is really like deafening sometimes. Oh, but that wasn't even the worst. And then after they go home, because their parents are done work, they go home. Then they come out for band practice. And that was the worst. It's the drum line. Band practice. And they band practice. And it's mostly drum line. Yes. You couldn't think. Because they actually it was a relatively <laughs> solid concrete wall. Uh, for most part, in between that and our house, but they would practice in the street in front of the house. 
Oh my lord, oh. Nadia. <laughs> there are times I sorry, I don't know why I'm laughing. I, I still I have I'm laughing, I, I have that freaking drum line in my gonna, head still. Yeah, I can totally I could, pull it up. I could continue. absolutely do it. I don't want it because it's gonna haunt you at night. It was so that you couldn't write, you couldn't talk, you couldn't do anything. It was so in I mean, it just vibrates through every five. The cats would run away. I mean, everything. Would, it was so freaking loud. And there's nothing you can do. I mean, it's just, it's you're in a different culture again. And it's just the way it is. And the parents are there and the kids are there. And they're all excited because they're practicing for the next festival or the next fair. And, and we're just laughing. Just laughing. It'll stop. <laughs> 530 is almost here. And it was almost like, uh, oh, later on, actually, we're going to fast forward a little bit. Um, and give you a sneak peek because at some point uh, there'll be a documentary coming out about Ramba and you get to see a little bit about the dinosaur oh. and the dinosaurs that were uh, part of an exhibit, a dinosaur exhibit. And it was so invasive there also. Oh, it, this park you, you, where she was. Yeah, yeah, in the park there she was. So you get a feel for it in this documentary, which is really a beautiful documentary. We're so excited about it coming out and hopefully sometime this year it's going to start hitting festivals in the United States. Um, but there's an, there's a scene in there where we turn off the the um, the audio, and it's like you can finally breathe. It's this it's yeah. so invasive, and that's what it's like. It's like when are they going to stop? When are they going to stop? And when they did stop, it's like, oh God, thank you. <laughs> Oh, so was it only drums or was it trumpets as well? Or was it like a band? Yeah. It's just a drum. Mm. It's wow. It didn't okay. have other instruments. And our, initially we thought, you know, we knew there was a festival coming up and there was a big agricultural festival or something like that. We thought it was going to be preparing for that. And then we realized that after the agricultural festival, there was about a week off and then they started preparing for the Christmas festival or whatever it was, was going to be next. And then when it was the next um, holiday festival, it was like, oh my God, they're always practicing the same song all the time yeah, you know, for five yeah. hours a day. It was nuts. <laughs> it was crazy. Okay. What, what song was it? Oh, okay. What song okay. was it? I mean, it, was just a, it? It was just a drum beat. It wasn't, oh even a song. It, wasn't it was just the, the drum, the bass drum line, but it was, wow. It was Again, it's still in our hearts somewhere <laughs> embedded in our memories. So there we are, Guaranta, trying to make phone calls, trying to make internet work. Um, sometimes internet works, sometimes it doesn't. Trying to communicate with who we can, trying to see what was available for land options. The city, the, the mayor was still very interested. The vice mayor was still very helpful. Um, we start looking for lands and they connect us with different realtors. And one of the amusing, entertaining stories is they would say, Hey, meet me at five 30 sharp. It's going to take three hours to get to the property and three hours to get to the property from the city is actually considered relatively close. You know, five hours from the city is, uh, that one's a little bit far away, but two to three hours, that's considered okay. close. Um, so we're going to look in these lands all over the place. I speak almost no Portuguese at that point. Um, and we they meet me at 530. Okay. I'm out at the front of the gate, 530. Nobody shows up 545. No one six o'clock. No seven o'clock. No 730. No eight o'clock. The oh, kids have shown up. The kids have shown we'll, up. We'll, yeah. The kids have already, they started playing. Uh, so I'm working on the curb because I don't want to miss them either. So I'm working on the curb, sitting on my computer and everyone's staring at the white guy, you know, <laughs> working on his computer on the curb in front of the school. Um, so the um stranger at, danger <laughs> at some point we get a call saying oh by the way um uh, they didn't have your contact they they contacted me in sao paulo and you know i forgot to message you that they're not coming today well they did have my contact because last night they told oh. me what time they were coming so then the next day shows up you know the same sort of thing and sometimes they show up in time sometimes they don't but i'm always there waiting at the clock except for one day I was 10 minutes late to get there and they were so pissed off at me. You know, these are the realtors that I've waited for forever. And like, you know, you have no respect for our time. I was like, what are you talking about? It was like, okay, I'm in a different world. I'm in a different world, I'm in a different world. Soon the music will stop. Um, it, it was it was interesting getting used to the culture. And again, going back to our friends, um, you know, the, the English teachers, uh, Paolo and Nacciali, 
they were so helpful to help us understand, you know, this is normal, whether you are Brazilian or Argentine or American, you're going to have that same type of treatment. It wasn't because we were foreigners. It's just how things are. It's just the culture. So we're starting to understand more about the culture. Uh, people are still asking us, why are we still staying here? <laughs> you know, uh, But the motivation is still elephants. We found some lands that were really interesting. Um, we found some lands that were pretty terrible. The amount of properties that we saw and all the ridiculous stories are way too much to go into. But I mean, we were essentially, Scott was taken to a cow graveyard for one property. It was a place. This, that- this is an important one, actually. Um, you know, this is after we looked at, uh, uh, we we named them after things that we could remember. One was hungry cows because the cows followed us the whole time we walked the property. The cows were like 10 meters behind us. Yeah, they were a little ominous in the way they were following. So I was like, okay, we're going to be killed by cows. We had another one that was called fruit filled confusion because we couldn't tell which roads were where and where the property line, but there were fruit trees everywhere. It was actually really, we, we actually tried to buy this property. We were really close to signing a contract. And when they were doing the title search, they realized the person selling it to us actually didn't have a true, uh, wasn't the rightful owner. The, the, the person he bought oh, it from minor. was, yeah, minor detail. The person he bought it from and spent his whole investment to buy this property, life investment to buy this property was not the legal owner. And it was a, it was a, a falsified document. And this guy was genuinely oh, gosh. mortified. He invested everything he had into this property and he had no recourse to get it back. Uh, oh gosh! And we had another one, beautiful birds that we were going to buy. Yeah, uh, that was something that was a lot smaller. It mm-hmm. was about a hundred hectares, I think, uh, going way small because we were really getting desperate to move something forward. A lot of properties that we looked at didn't have any land documents similar to or had the same type of land agreement that, that their first donated land. Um, and then the day we were going to sign that contract, he showed up and said, "Sorry, I can't sell it. My brother doesn't want to do this. He wants to keep the land." So that one fell through. And poor Nakia, um, as a side note, she was pregnant with twins at the time, and at this meeting. She literally started to cry and walked away and said she was going to punch him in the face. So she had to get up. (laughs) She was so tired and she was so pregnant at that time and so hormonal. Oh, bless. She literally wanted to kill this man. So she walked away so she didn't punch him and get arrested, which was kind of charming. And it was this week because we were going back to the United States for a conference and we we're going to be meeting some folks that were following us and supporting us. And we we're going to give them an update of what we were going to be doing is actually a conference at pause and give an update about land, hopefully. And that's when after six months of being here or five months of being here, no land, no, not even a promise at that oh. point because everything was falling through. Um, and I met with the vice mayor uh, and some other folks and they said, no, we have some options. And during that meeting is we had some options for you. This land is great. It's not far from the main highway. It'll be amazing. We can put a gas station and a restaurant on top of the hill so we can see the elephants. I'm like, no, 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 no. This is not what's going to happen after many no, no, conversations. No. And this was another realtor that was talking about realtor land development because they're trying to pull people in from all sides because they know we're getting frustrated in the city. But the city, city still wanted the project, uh, desperately wanted the project. So the mayor says, hey, I have an idea. Let's go to That's the pro- property. We can actually give this land to you. It's 250 hectares. Uh, it's a way to get started. And so as we're driving up, there's you know, clear cutting on one side, pasture on the other side. And we drive into the land and there are hundreds of carcasses of cows. And I said, oh gosh, so what is this? What? Oh no, don't worry about it. We can dig it. We can dig a hole and we can just push them all to the side. It was like, I'm not laughing because no. it's funny. I was, I was like, laughing because there was just no comprehension that this was not okay. And I'm not talking, I mean, I say hundreds, there may have been thousands in various states of decay. And he said, what happens when, when farmers' cows die, they know this is the pro- the, the property of the, the, uh, the city. So they used to go move them and dump them on the city property. And it is, I mean, you, you drive in, in a car and you just have this dread. I mean, this overwhelming feeling of just death. And it was. Oh my gosh. That sounds terrible. But I'm trying to be the, you know, Hey, you're still trying to help me. Let's see the back of the property. Let's look. And it's really, really pretty for us. It's actually gorgeous (laughs) trees. And we walk back there and somehow in this, lunacy in my mind at that point i'm thinking well maybe you know and it's like no this isn't gonna work we have thousands of dead cows in the front of the property and then as we're on our way out 
he says to me, you know what's really nice about this property? He said, I know the guy that owns across the street and he's ready to put up a hotel to receive guests. I'm like you <laughs> still don't freaking get it. No one gets it. So we drive a little bit more in front of this property and it's slash and burn, completely slash and burn Amazon forest. And it, they're putting in soy field. So if it wasn't enough that we had Cal graveyard, you know, hotel across the street, hotel across the street, <laughs> And then you go forward and the next Amazon deforestation. Get, yeah. The next door person is going to have a soy field. And we already know the, 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 the uh, toxic effect of soy plantations with the incredible amount of agrotoxins that they use here. Uh, we drove a little bit further looking because he wanted to talk to another landowner that he know we drive down there and somebody had diverted a river about three kilometers of a river to make the river go through his property. I said, that can't be illegal. He said, uh, that can't be legal. He said, no, it's not. He said, but there is never authority that will ever come out here so they can do whatever they want. I'm like, wow, we're in the wrong place. Um, and was, they had already started looking at land in other places um, and looking all over, talking to people with using lands for carbon offset up in the Amazon forest. We had been looking you know, up in the East coast in the Northeast of Brazil up by the, the entrance of the, the, the mouth of the Amazon. Uh, we had looked all over the place and online had looked at hundreds and hundreds of properties. And at that point, we really, I think it was, no, we looked at one more property there. They were supposed to be leaving to go to the United day States before. the day before. Uh, we found this property and it is stunning. And it's people that are friends of Nacciali and Paolo. So we know we can actually trust them because we would trust okay. Ali and Paolo with very, our lives. And very, very honest. We and pretty much did give them our lives. They basically said, you can start using land at no cost. Uh, pay us later. Pay us once you get started. We'll work that out. So we go to the United States super excited about we actually have something positive going on. And that night, the vice mayor shows up and tells us we have to leave our house starting <laughs> now. We're supposed to leave and, we're supposed to be leaving and go to the airport at five in the morning. Um, and this is eight o'clock at night and he shows up and I'm supposed to be going on the way to meet with the landowners of this property that I had seen. Um, and interesting side note, because throughout this time, I'm trying to practice more Portuguese. And when we talk about the positive people that, you know, the positive energy around the project, there was still a lot of movement, a lot of enthusiasm. And I got in the car that morning with a different realtor to go look at this property. He actually owned the farm next door to this particular land, the one that is the friends of Nacional and Paulo. And on the way back, uh, he pulled the car off the road and he said, I have to tell you, he said, I am now going to be an advocate for elephants. He said, what you have told me has completely changed my, my perspective on what we need to do. And that was my first okay, maybe I got this Portuguese thing going on, you know, because I'm, we're using charades, I'm making helicopter noises about elephants being, you know, culled in Africa, you know, and making, you know, but he got the point and for him to stop that he, and I, we got back to uh, the city and he gave me a hug and he just said, thank you. He said, anything you need, I'm here for you. Uh, this person a little bit later on to fast forward, it was a few weeks later after the trip to the United States and things started falling through again. He said to me, he called me to, I went to his office to see how, if he had anything new. And he said, look, he said, I love what you're doing. He said, you're in the wrong place. This is not where you need to be. Culturally, you're going to end up with a lot of roadblocks because this is still the wild west. Um, and, and, you know, it's very okay. much pro, pro agriculture. So to go to backtrack a little bit on this land of Nacho and Palo, it ended up in the same policy the same group that the first land in it had been given to them for land use and they still had another four years before they could transfer it but they also in our process of investigating that title they also discovered a problem uh that they had to resolve and it was going to take another three to four years for them to get that new result so again this very promising land fell through for us and that's when we started looking more seriously everywhere else oh no it was a little sad. So Guaranta de Norci. Uh, to end this on a good note, um, we stayed in Guaranta. Uh, we started looking all over the place even more thoroughly and uh, continuing conversations. And we this found this property that we actually are living in right now online, uh, randomly. Oh. That's when I started reading more about Chapada dos Gamenez, which is the municipality where we are. Um, 
And it was interesting because people kept saying, it's cold, it's cold, it's cold, it's way cold there. It's like, how can it be cold? It's in Mato Grosso. It's you know, in the, you know, the, south, you know, the southern part of you know, the Amazon, the northern part of the Sahado. How can it be cold? But indeed, the city itself can get down to you know, three or four degrees uh, Celsius at times. Although it's rare, it can happen. Uh, and for folks that are living in Guaranta de Norte, where it never gets below, oh my God. you know, uh, 25 90. degrees, I think, <laughs> you know, it's always hot okay. in, in, in Guaranta for them to think about three degrees, you know, they're like, oh, no, you can't live there at all. Uh, but we did a lot of research and we ended up coming down to explore. And that started the next layer of land exploration in Guaranta, in uh, um, Chapada dos Comedes. Ah, so we are going to end this episode on a happy note. Although I, I must say, I must just quickly go back. Not that some of our listeners are um, a little bit disturbed about the the cow graveyard. Um. Yeah, basically, they don't know the cause of death. You know, you don't know is it, is it a toxin? Is it you know? You have no idea. Disease, um, venomous snake. I mean, you just don't know. Um, and for them to then take a risk to eat the meat off that cow, I, I, it's generally not a practice. That any- That's something we see here, though. I mean, we have, you know, we have one of our neighbors has cows, but he doesn't have a lot of cows. He has a very small herd of cows um, that actually <laughs> we always know they're his cows because they're not the typical colors, but also they're very social. Um, they come to say hello versus running away from you, which is what most cows do that aren't kept super well. Um, but yeah, we've gone to his property to help lift the cow. Um, they were just there the other week when one of his cows had a problem standing up after giving birth. Um, but yeah, we don't see that sort of mass dumping ground in this area, thankfully. You no, know, it's very different culturally. You know, you're 10 hours away in the same state. This is a different world, uh, very, very different world here. This is the episode of traumas. We had the we had the, the music, the drum line, and the cows, and the multiple we didn't properties. Even talk about living at the house of fish. <laughs> oh yeah, we didn't get there. So oh, that'll have to wait for another episode. That will have to wait. Stay, okay. Stay tuned for House of Fish episode seven. <laughs> Okay, then uh, we have ended on a happy note because uh, you said that the property that you are actually in now, you sort of found that online, or at least parts of it you found online. So we'll we'll touch uh, we'll touch base again uh, next week or in two weeks when you have time. So thank you very much for uh, for joining us again and taking time out of your busy schedule. So just briefly, what 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 are you going to continue doing today? Oh, it's we've got thirty minutes before elephant dinner time. So so a few things we have oh. to wrap up and then it is time to feed elephants. Yeah, but it oh, is. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah, we know the story is uh, <laughs> uh, challenging at times, but, you know, again, going back to the very start of watching these elephants graze and, you know, when we get to share what actually happened, uh, it's really a remarkable end to uh, the struggles. And, you know, the reality is the thing we're still just beginning. You know, uh, yeah. around the property is developed. We have you know, elephants that are just doing wonderfully, uh, but it's just the beginning for for this project and uh, for more, many more elephants to come. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time and uh, enjoy elephant dinner time. So yeah, catch up uh, next week or the week after that, whenever your schedule permits. And thank you very much and take care. You too, Nadia. We'll talk soon. Take care, Nadia. Stay warm. I will. Okay, that wraps up episode six. Thank you very much for listening and joining in. Our wonderful producer, Amy, is going to put everything in the show notes, but do send us an email at podcast at globalelephants.org. And uh, yeah, ask me any questions that you'd like me to ask. Scott and Kat, take care and see you in the next episode. Bye. (laughs) 